So my name's Andrea. I also get called Tan. I'm from an organisation called S7. And that organisation is also part of a bigger emergence called Together. So the S7 Foundation began really from three different directions. There was myself, who was based in Northern England, and I had got a little bit disenchanted with the corporate world and had decided to set up I was something I was calling a co-creation platform. And this was, I guess, a technology that would allow people to co-create, and co-create means something pretty specific to me, so I can maybe talk about that later. There was also Chris Larkham, who was based in Southern England, and he was working independently. He was in the middle of doing a PhD and studying whole systems thinking and cybernetics, amongst other things. And he'd had a bit of an epiphany that if we didn't do something different as a planet from a scientific lens, things were going to go belly up. And so he, he left his PhD and began to explore the use of holonic technology as a means of allowing us to uh, see our planet differently and organise on the planet differently. So that was very connected to what I was seeing from a co-creative perspective, even though that was more social. And then, uh, at the, the other side of the planet in America was, was Brett Wachowski. He's the third co-founder of S7. And he was very interested in kind of crowdfunding, but what he was calling crowd creation, taking crowdfunding to the next level. And that intersected with my vision of co-creation Another thing he was interested in was something called spiritual philanthropy, which is a completely different way of looking at how we flow energy and resources collectively. So together we all had those ideas, inspirations and seeings of, of something very different. And when I set up my network, I went looking for people who resonated with my vision and through different synchronicities, I would say I was connected with Brett and Chris and within four months probably I think it was we then met in my home in northern England and started to synergize our ideas into a greater whole and from there S7 was born. So Chris is probably the best person to describe what holonic technology is. I will give a, a representation more probably from a sociological perspective so the concept of a holon was conceived by Arthur Kessler and it's been since used by other philosophers to describe this concept that a lot of, pretty much anything, anything in nature, a thing, we say, <laughs> can be described as something that's both a whole and a part. So my hand is a whole thing, it's a hand but it's part of my arm and my arm is a whole thing but it's part of my body. Whatever is in around us, we could possibly describe in this holonic way. So holonic technology is a way of organising the world in that holonic fashion. We can put data into holons saying how something is both a whole and a part at the same time. The reason that that's a revolution from our perspective is because we can always therefore see how everything is interconnected. Everything is always both a whole and a part and that allows us to get out of what S7 and many other thinkers in this realm call separation thinking. So separation thinking is something that is seems to be predominant in the way our current reality is organised. So if there's a business over in one part of the world creating um, things that are made out of wood, do they think about the impact of how they, that wood was maybe like how a forest was chopped down in another part of the world and how that affected maybe a village, some people, or the wildlife there. You can't, we cannot, or at least, we, 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 well, we can separate things, that's okay, we do do that, but if we want to understand the impact of interconnectedness on our activities in the world, holonic thinking means we always see the intersectedness of everything that we're doing. So holonic technology is a breakthrough socially, it's also a breakthrough technologically because every piece of data that we start is connected to itself and that gives rise to a phenomenon I guess of a global brain like technology.
I am very passionate about the concept of, of being whole as a human being and it's very connected to what we call whole systems, development whole systems platforms. What I mean by uh, a whole person is the concept that all the different functions and things that make up a person are all considered equally. I perceive, from my point of view, that in dominantly in the Western world we for example, don't take our feelings as uh, seriously as we might, um, you know, take into account our mental faculties. We privilege a lot the mental body, I would say, in the men in the Western world, and we often put aside feelings. So, my personal experience in the workplace is that we can be very intellectual in our endeavours, but is anybody talking about the fact that two people in the room maybe hate each other? Probably not. And it comes out in very distorted ways. Maybe there's underlying tension and politics, but those feeling relationships are beneath the surface and affecting everything that we do. That's just one example. For a whole person, for me, it therefore is about thinking about the mental body, the emotional body, and also the physical body, and ensuring that we design systems in our world that support that whole person, and therefore that we we feel that all of the parts of ourselves are being supported and we're not conflicted in any way and one part of us is less optimal than the other and less valued. So one of my also connected passions that's very related to this subject comes from studying the, the, the work of Carl Jung, the psychologist. And his work became the inspiration for a psychometric model called the Myers-Briggs type instrument. And that model was um, developed to bring Carl Jung's thinking kind of to the jaw on the street. Carl Jung's thinking was very involved and very complex so they wanted to find a way to make this accessible to all. So I became a practitioner in the Myers-Briggs type instrument and I would say that I'm as much a, a fan of, of their stuff as I am actually the original work of Carl Jung and ultimately what, what Jung and Myers-Briggs are helping to evidence to all of us is that we, we all have these different ways of relating to the world. And as it happens, when we study young in psychology and ourselves in this context and the Myers-Briggs type instrument, some of us relate, in, relate more to other parts of ourselves than other parts. So what, what I was observing as, as, as a, Myers-Briggs, uh, a Myers-Briggs type instrument practitioner in the workplace is that the values of, of some values are, are valued more than others in the way the workplace has been constructed and how we operate in the workplace. And the way I can distill this is, put very simply, Myers-Briggs and Carl Jung divide up our way of, of experiencing things psychologically into these things called dichotomies. There are four major dichotomies. So we're either, and, and many people have heard of this, they either, they, we either have a preference for extroversion versus introversion, or a preference for sensing versus intuition, which is not to be muddled up with just like girly feelings of intuition, it, 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 it refers to something else. The other polarity is thinking and feeling, which relates to how we make decisions. And then there's a fourth polarity called judging and perceiving, and that relates to how we go about wanting to make decisions. In the workplace, and this is evident in Myers-Briggs type research, there is a leaning towards the poles of extroverted, sensing, thinking, judging. What this means, <laughs> what this means put simply, is that we value in the workplace the things that we see, the outward world, the outward environment. We value data that's reliable and physical, that can be experienced through the physical senses. We tend to trust more thinking-based decisions that are logical, and we tend to very much value being decisive and, and punctuality, actually, which comes from the judging preference. Now, as a Myers-Briggs type instrument fan, and also um, somebody who was very interested in Carl Jung and his work, it, it revealed to me that the poles of INFP, introverted, intuitive, feeling, perceiving, i.e. being a, preferring to use your feelings as a way to make decision, being very creative and open about your decision making, not needing to have an exactness. And that can show up, I don't need to be on time actually, there's so many variables in the world, why would I choose to show up at exactly this time? And, and then the, the other polarity of introversion, which is 
I'm actually as interested in my inner world maybe as I am the outer world. Those poles are less valued in the workplace and Myers-Briggs type instrument research actually validates that. People, we have to wait the results to take into the account that the business world does not value these preferences as a way of experience in the world. And how does that translate like when, when that is the major, the main way of seeing and doing things that, that we've got in the system right now, what's, what's it translate to like, uh, and what does it mean for the introverts? Too? Yeah, yeah. It translates into a lot of frustration and tension if you are, as I am, um, have preferences for introversion, intuitive feeling and perceiving. So what that might look like is an introvert, for an example, somebody with an introverted preference, they, they prefer to process their data internally before they process it externally. And how that shows up is rather than speaking and talking about the data I'm dealing with, I might want to be alone for some time and write down and reflect and be with myself. As a somebody who has a preference for introversion also gets energy that way. Now, in my experience, that's not always cool in a in a boardroom. People want to know now what that you think. If you're quiet, they think you have nothing to say, not that you want to go away and think about it. Very much like this extroverted preference towards our expression in, in, in that moment. And the other thing about the extrovert is their process through talking. So it's really great if you're an extrovert in the boardroom, you're actually working it out through the talking and you're actually coming to your conclusions through speaking. So it's one example of how people with, with the introverted preference may not feel so comfortable in that kind of environment. The other ones, some examples are things like, did my feelings come into the equation when I make a decision? I just had a, a gut feeling or I had a dream or I had a, a sensation that this was the right thing to do. It's like, can you evidence that? Can you put it in a plan? Can you put it in a spreadsheet and show me all the statistics that it makes sense? So feeling preference may not be used and also certainly as a way of, it's not valued for somebody with a feeling preference to say, well, all this is very well and good, but I'm feeling that the feelings in here are in the way. I, I can't imagine I could have ever said that in the environments I worked in. So there's some of the examples, there's many, many more of them. The Infinite World game is inspired from many directions. Of course, in my own context, it's very much inspired from the things we've been talking about. How can we build a social operating system that supports this whole person idea? The fact that I can be introverted, extroverted, feely, I can be logical, I might be creative, or actually I'm not creative at all, I'm a very repetitive type of person that enjoys mechanical type activity. How can we design systems and processes and ways of organising that support every kind of person and the whole being? And when I say social operating system, that's my kind of way of saying a whole new way of organising economically, socially, culturally and interpersonally. The nearest model we have or the nearest example might be something like capitalism. So it sounds very lofty when I say we want to create a whole new social operating system, but that's actually what we want to do. And we believe it has to come in a whole system's way. You cannot just fix a little piece of capitalism over here and think it's going to fix these issues. Because from my point of view, and I'll, I'll bring in some more of my history here, our current systems were built mainly inspired or based on masculine values. And I'm not picking on men when I say this. I'm just literally pointing to the fact that as a, somebody who's been involved in the history of gender academically, we can see that the men, men often were the first to go out, out into the workplace. They designed many of the systems and structures we have now for organising industrially or in an enterprising fashion. And it's not that all men are completely like um, biased towards masculine values. I need to be very clear, masculine is different to male. Men and women can have masculine values and men and women can have feminine values. But there is a natural preference for men towards mas masculine values, or a dominant one I might say, not natural, that's not really fair. So 
what we see it from if we look through the lens of feminism especially is that most of our social systems have been built predominantly on masculine values and therefore it's just natural that they have embodied within them certain ways of seeing certain ways of thinking so the infinite world game or at least part of it is a reset what if we design it with our whole systems whole person hat on what if we design for feminine values too it's not about getting rid of the masculine values or the men <laughs> it's about saying let's have a balance of of masculine and feminine in this system so one example I can give you of this is the a feminine value very much is around being open to what is occurring and not having to have this definite definite view on things and that definiteness shows up in various ways in our current institutions it might be that we can be very definite that we're going to deliver a project in three months time the feminine aspect is more we don't know there are so many variables we don't know what might happen and we refer to that in in the infinite world game as emergence so so many variables come in we we have a principle of emergence and a principle of being definite and a principle of emergence sit side by side um, another example might be how we deal with separateness i would say that from my studies in 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 feminine feminist literature that often they would associate separation thinking with the masculine quality it's individualism you know the individualist world every man for himself and this concept that we can um, we can look at things purely from a, a binary lens ones and zeros lens that is traditionally considered to be a masculine value and again in its own right it's very valuable however running the world purely on that value is not necessarily a clever thing to do because we have the feminine principle of interconnectedness everything is part of one organism whatever I do over here affects what happens over here chemistry and physics is showing us this and it's it's not just some airy fairy feminine <laughs> concept <laughs> so we want to bring in again a balance of interconnectedness with with what I call autonomy so the infinite world game has instead of this idea of businesses over here and there's businesses over here and they compete they're separate we have a concept of a business over here which is autonomous and has some authority a lot of authority over its world and its reality and likewise over here but they're part of a bigger synergy affecting each other and that effect of their synergy is also part of the world game so it's what I call relational autonomy they're simultaneously parts and wholes male and female or masculine and feminine so like they're, they're, uh, <laughs> they're making it more of a kaleidoscope in essence, right? that there's all of these lenses to see the world through oh yes yeah, so that's another part of the infinite world game which comes again from the feminine principle so our current paradigm has another uh, value around uh, how I might name this is materialist reductionism maybe Chris might say it's Newtonian or something but we look at things as they are in this very physical reduced sense and that gives birth to an objective way of looking at the world there are things and there are rules if I push this chair it will fall over they are, those rules are consistent the feminine aspect is more subjective which comes from feeling linked to feeling in Myers-Briggs type indicator or Jungian psychology it's more well there are all these things and rules but I have my individual reaction to that my subjective world and how I might experience it is very different to how you might experience it Rob so that's more the concept of uh, sub a subjective lens on the world and the infinite world game has built into it this idea of omnicentricity what that means is yeah we have all these consistent rules but actually when I'm in Rob's universe it looks different because he has a different view of the world he has his own perception so the infinite world game incorporates lots of thinking about lenses and perceptions and allows for each individual to have their own universe and perception and it takes that seriously as well as the objective rules that are consistent amongst us all Fantastic. <laughs> so it opens up the many more variables to be seen and, uh, and appreciated
Well, that's where my heart is in that because really what, what really turns me on, we've talked about all the psychology and the social stuff, but what really turns me on is every human being is a unique, a unique gift to the world. And what makes them unique, their unique perspective. And if we don't celebrate that and design for that, I, I actually just find it very uninspiring. I'm just like, that's just boring. The, the thing that most excites me is your uniqueness and honoring that and celebrating it and allowing it to flourish. So it's at the heart of the Infinite World game. It's, it's celebrating unique perspectives and our unique, our unique treasures that we bring to each other. <laughs>
Convergence in 1987. And 2012, for anyone who heard about it, was the beginning of those that build up and mount into something coming alive at a planetary level. I think that therefore the new paradigm is now really kicking off and our involvement in this and others around us are building new worlds based on that mature, balanced understanding of reality. I think that the education system is entirely interwoven with all the other pieces of the system that we call capitalism, founded on a certain type of scientific thought and philosophy and values. So my reduction of the education system is we are being groomed as workers for an industrial machine, which sounds quite negative, but I do think that that's what it's about. I think that in the school environment, we do not understand the, the wisdom that's in a young person and how that's interconnected with, to everything else in the universe. I think, I think it's hundreds of years away before even the educational system really embraces that in any way. I'm, I'm talking about mainstream. And therefore, the, the systems, as in the workplace, do not really respond to our soul's evolution and purpose, as well as being a, a giver to our current society. And there are not tools to work with the emotional, intuitive intelligence of the young people and the children. So I just think it's a the edu current education system is built uh, again on a certain set of values and I think that as our values shift the way education works will be much different. I have been to conferences and took part in many activities with people in our networks that are particularly specialised in this area so people who are based in universities or schools and are seeing as we are the systemic issues in education that are arising from these values so I was at a, a a big event in Cyprus where I was part of a team called Thriveability and we were looking at what does it mean to be a thriving whole person human being, again that term whole person, to be a thriving whole person human being, does it really mean going to school every day and sitting in the same room? Does it really mean having one person be your authority all the time? Does it really mean learning parrot fashion from a book? about something that does not excite you in any way whatsoever and really you, you're not interested in pursuing. We were looking at true thrivability from a, a perspective of what does it mean to feel nice? What does it mean to not be sat in a classroom and have your body gener regenerated by the environment around you? What about working in the swimming pool, which we did by the way, our group worked in the swimming pool. What about the, the real world as a living school and learning from the real world and having real experiences rather than reading from books and what does it mean to feel connected to your fellow fellow human beings so I was in that five ability group and there were many other groups for example looking at curriculum or looking at environment and I think there's a whole revolution coming in that way and I think that in the new paradigm, the homeschooling movement is very much a part of that because a lot of people who are homeschooling have seen the, the effects of that system on their children from this whole person lens and are beginning to look at what it might look like from a different point of view. So I really actually want to celebrate everybody who's had the courage to homeschool their kids. I know some of them and I deeply honour them. <laughs> yeah, and it's another aspect that we didn't touch on really is the segregation of, of the year, year groups. You know, so that they don't interact with anyone who's older or younger uh, uh, mm -hmm. to a large degree anyway. I mean, you can't stop them all the time. But, uh, they try to, <laughs> I think, stop them from interacting with other Absolutely. Yeah. We see, We saw that at um, Synergy Hub. We had, I mean, just going back to my own past, I used to, when I was in senior school, I used to enjoy hanging around with the people who were three years older than me. And so in classrooms I was with people my own age and then I tended to gravitate to the older kids because I just resonated with them more. So that's a little bit touching upon from a personal point of view what you said. In terms of experiencing that now in this paradigm and my own experiences, we, we were in Synergy Hub and we had a young kid come in, he was Drew, Drew. he's around 10, who you know, 
and he has been homeschooled, being homeschooled, and the, his parents who were homeschooling him led him do different activities in the hub with us. So sometimes Drew would be doing his own thing, sometimes he would take part in a meeting with us and a workshop, sometimes he would obviously eat with us and what he was doing is learning from all of us. He, On one occasion I, I found him sat in the park, again thriving, he's in the park, he's not in a classroom, with uh, my co-creator Mona uh, who is from Egypt and she was teaching him in the park all about Egypt. She's a real Egyptian. You cannot, how does that compare to reading in a book in the library, sitting with a real Egyptian in the park? And he also like played with, with Chris in the text space, so he started to learn what holons are. He gave us all a presentation. He was learning how to present, so that was supremely fruitful for him and also gave him an education and a wealth of learning that he it just it doesn't compare. Yeah, you can use that as a wellspring. Yes, he just and he was learning multiple skills at once and learning how to get on with young and old, older people alike. And I think everybody who meets Drew comments on that his confidence around elders or adults, whatever you want to call them, and young people. He's completely confident in all spaces and people from all backgrounds. So Synergy Hub was a gift from the universe. <laughs> it was a, um, an old care home in Rotterdam and we were fortunate enough to be connected with a group called the Maestron, the Maestron Foundation? Was it the Maestron yes. Foundation? I just saw you used to call them the Maestron now, the Maestron Foundation. And the Maestron Foundation was set up, was set up by two very people very close to my heart, very inspiring men. Who, who have also seen this shift coming from their own perspective and were particularly interested in what we call the resource-based economy part of this whole picture. So the resource-based economy idea is around um, resources becoming more of a basis of our economic exchange. And it's a bit complex, I won't, I won't go into detail, but essentially their way of playing with the resource-based economy was to create these huge spaces that could be shared for people to realize their purpose and the resources around them were available for them as long as nobody else was using them. So instead of like, it's my office, I rented this and this is my furniture, you would get to like use the resources and see how much more efficient and effective we could be and how much closer that made us. Another part of therefore that vision was to open up a floor they, they, run, they run the business through other more traditional means, but there was a whole floor made available to what we might call the new paradigm to come and play with this resource-based way of being and also start to integrate some of the concepts the rest of us were bringing, for example, S7 co-creation. There was another group there called Unity who were interested in food sharing and a group called United Earth that were interested in connecting people, working on solutions. So we, we spent uh, maybe six to seven months living in an old care home, courtesy of the Maestrom Foundation, and exploring our ideas. And I, I, I would call it, it was a huge success for me as a living lab and as an as a experience with emergent thinking. For some people, it, it was challenging for them because it didn't have the yet mature structures that we want that we're used to and so it was it could be unnerving for people it's not like you came in and somebody said here are the rules here is your boss here is your job it was very much a playground of how is this going to work and what does work and what doesn't so for s7 we had we're tremendously grateful for that experience we got to see a lot of things that are going to really really work in this new way of thinking and also what really doesn't work <laughs> And thank, thank the Lord they, they create the space for that kind of experiment. So Synergy Hub from an S7 point of view was something quite specific as a prototype. S7 has this seeing, which, which we share with everybody here at what we call Together, that when we organise differently a new lifestyle would emerge. So. Right now, 
the dominant lifestyle when it comes to work is I get a job, I get employed, and I either show up at the office or I work from home and I have a contract or something. But that's and it's generally a nine to five kind of lifestyle. And then I have my home, which has nothing to do often with that workspace. That my home is my sanctuary where all my personal stuff goes on and isn't connected in the same way to that 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 working space. And in feminism, they call there, there is, that is described by one particular writer as separate spheres. They talk about the, the concept of separate spheres, work over here, home over here, feelings over here, feminine values over here, and masculine values over here. So this separate spheres idea, at S7 we were seeing that would collapse with a new whole systems type way of thinking and lifestyle. So we wanted to create these spaces where that could be experienced. And when we first went to Synergy Hub, it was a vision. After Synergy Hub, we became much more clear in what it looks like. So I'll describe it from that point of view. We are imagining that in this new paradigm, first thing is people will find their passions. First and foremost, the most important thing. What is, what is the thing that most makes you come alive? What is exciting? Connect with that. Once they've found that passion and are identified at least something of what it looks like, they need a space to find and meet with people freely who share that passion who can help them create that experience. So this is what the teal, there's a, there's a business paradigm, paradigm called teal right now, or it's, you know, it's the badge that's given to it, teal. And the, the teal thinkers are also seeing this and it's, it's often described as self-organization. So instead of someone's organizing me, you're organizing yourself. So synergy hubs are first the base where the self-organization can start to happen. I've now met you, Rob, you said you also had a passion for taking care of dolphins. Do we want to set up a dolphin sanctuary together or not? And then it gives people space to explore that. And here comes again the whole person thinking, not just logically, but emotionally. Do we get on? Are we mates? Like, do I trust you? Do I like, like being around you? Do we really resonate? So that's what we call the synergization process. And we envision Synergy Hubs having Synergy Lounges where people can live and be and just explore that. A bit like dating, you dating. And then after that happens, of course, people might go, actually, yeah, we get on great. We want to create something together and we want space to do that. So Synergy Hubs will provide workspaces a bit like an impact hub. I don't know if people have heard of impact hubs, but work in social entrepreneurial spaces where People can just turn up with their laptop and hang out, but they will also provide residential areas where people can live and work and not have this division between home and life because they're family. They like hanging out together and actually they don't have to work nine to five every day. They might show up for two hours and walk up a mountain together and work. It's all becomes integral and holistic. And then we are also seeing some other li little bits emerge with the Synergy Hub concept around supporting people to be, which is a very feminine principle. So they have time to be and find out who they are and then move to the action. And that's broadly what a seven and our co-creators together are seeing. There are some other parts of that, like the would be, I've got this idea of something I'm calling the, the hollow deck. It's not an idea, actually. It's it's something that's part of our process here. But when I name it physically, the hollow deck is a big hall in a synergy hub with holons on the floor, through which you can organise in what we call our hollow ship process. So that's the equivalent of our boardroom, I guess. It's just more fun. You can lay on the floor if you want. You can play. You could do yoga. Uh, but that that is also maybe there'll be features like that. We also see technology integrated in these hubs. So the technology is a huge piece of our work. We see that there'll be an artificial intelligence, an AI, and as you come in, that AI, sh she's a she, <laughs> will immediately connect you with what's happening in the now and who you might be having a synergy with. And then there'll be dorms, dorm spaces, I think, where our technological vision isn't, again, classroom office style. Chris, again, on our team calls that like the old way of computing. Even our computers is set up with an office, yeah, Microsoft Office. Chris's vision and our vision at S7 is it's much more playful. So you're much more like Iron Man 
there'll be spaces you can go in, there's touch screens, tables, or there's these, um, you might put your VR specs on and you might work together in VR. Another one, you might have these these big screens, you know, with the, the technology projected onto it. That's the more Iron Man thing. But it'll be much, the technology, the desk is out. The desk is out in here, in the Synergy Hub. <laughs>beginning to feel quite repetitive on this theme but I it's also true for me that I associate nature again with a feminine principle we might we often hear the concept of mother Gaia or mother earth and in in again in through the feminine analysis the the myth the, the physical form our physical embodiment as human beings is quite a feminine interest so nursing, nourishment of the body, the kitchen, feeding us and then the wild, the wildlife around us, you know that feminine wild aspect is often a quality we associate with the feminine principle and again in our world, I, I don't think it's so true because of what happened across the last 10 years with ecology and what's happening with global warming and the, the, the collective response to that but often again we have left out what nature can reveal to us and the role of nature in our own self in how we live and work and be together. So one, one first thing is just what I've been talking about here. When we are working day on day, let's connect with nature. It's very good for our bodies. I mean, it's been, I don't, it, that's not coming from a woo-woo perspective, that's coming from science and studies. You spend time in nature, very good for your mental health, very good for your nervous system. We know that people who like, of course, exercise and are physical are much fitter and healthier. So first principle is spend more time in nature itself. So as a work, working principle thing, that is the first thing I would say about it. The second is the genius that is in nature. It's, we, we call ourselves biomimetic architects at, at seven and the, the people we co-create with because we look to nature for design principles to show us how things are done well and work and how we can learn from that. An example of the ants, we have Devorah in our, in our family and she, she studies ant life and looks at how ants organise so efficiently and effectively and we, we take inspiration from that in our social design. And then there are all the other principles that are embodied in nature such as what global warming has revealed, how one thing we might do in isolation, like creating some plastic and burning it and putting smoke out into the atmosphere, that affects the whole, the whole ecosystem. If the bees die, it affects our whole bee ecosystem. And we might think it's just an isolated thing in that separation thinking, oh the bees go, it doesn't make a difference. But when we look at the impact of the bees, it affects pretty much everything. So nature teaches us about interconnectedness and synergy again. And I think that, again, as the new paradigm really grows its muscles, it, it will show. I mean, I don't really work with anyone in this field who isn't inspired by nature and doesn't work with nature and value nature. And personally, I think it's all a symbol of human beings getting touch, back in touch with their own nature. I had in 2014 a real horrendous health scare. My first, I would, I, I think there comes a time in everybody's life when they have a major health scare. You know, it's not just a tooth falling out or something. And mine was, I was bleeding from the breast, and at one point quite, quite a lot. And at that time, I was, I was very much entering this new way of seeing. But I, I wasn't so much yet. I would say so integrated with my physical body and exploring that part of myself and my own relationship and empowerment around it and because of that dimension of myself that came online in 2012 around being more of a psychic and these messages I get when it started to happen I was getting messages that it, it was not good for me the, well, the first message that I got when it happened which was horrific I was in France and felt very alone, there was, you know, I, I couldn't go see my local doctor and I was freaking out, wondering what was going on. I went to bed and I got the message, 
when surgeons want to remove parts of your breasts, take a step back. And I, I got up the next morning and I said to my partner, I, this is serious. This is, it looks like surgeons are going to remove parts of my breast. Like, I don't think this is a light thing. Three or four months later, it, it was true. You know, I, I went back to England. I had scans. A surgeon told me that they thought it was a, like a, a very early possible cancer that couldn't be picked up on a mammogram. And they therefore re recommended that I remove all my breast ducts. So I, I'm still, you know, my mum was with me at the time and I can still remember, I was sat in the surgery in, with the surgeon and I just went, I need to take a step back. I used those exact words. And I came out of the hospital half inspired and half absolutely terrified. The cancer word is a big one for anyone. Like, I, I don't care how connected you are and how much you trust. The word cancer is is very scary to, to anyone, I would say. And that's come from speaking to a lot of people in a similar position to me. So I was really scared and I thought, what am I gonna do? I don't know anything about my body. I really didn't. I was really disconnected from my physical body. And the first thing that I realized in this moment is, this relates to the education question is, how much I had no faith in my own power to heal my own body. And also how in fear I was of the fact that I knew nothing about it. And I was taken back to my studies as a student at university, a philosopher called Michel Foucault, and he talks about this, and I didn't really understand it at the time, that the medical profession has disempowered us when it comes to our own physical health. We, unless a doctor tells you it's okay, or it's, or they, and whatever a doctor tells you, actually, when you feel unsafe physically, it's very hard to trust yourself that you know what to do. You trust the authority of the doctor and that's what he was talking about. So the first thing I realized is like, oh my goodness, like I feel totally capable of organizing the rest of my life. But when it comes to the thing that I live in, which is my body, I feel like a, a baby. And I, that gave me a lot of food for, food for thought anyway. I was like, wow, isn't that fascinating? You know, like the, the, the thing I wasn't taught most important through school is how to look after my physical body and how to keep it well. The, the second thing that happened was I was in some worlds fortunate but in, in my world just through pure synchronicity connected with um, a lot of people who were into alternative healing and they immediately picked up the phone having heard about what happened and said we, we can help you and I was like I don't think you can I'm terrified how can you heal this I did, I did in the end spend time with them and they gave me the inspiration I needed and that set off a whole different, put me in a, down a whole different path. I was suddenly on the path of researching everything about the body, how it heals, how it has natural capacities to heal, how surgery at times and pharmaceuticals are much, do much more harm, harm to the body and maybe than, than good and maybe in the in the immediate moment it doesn't look that way but further down the line it becomes apparent and I was I was just waking up I was I had no idea both that I had this capacity to heal and secondly how much damage I was doing to myself anyway and what that was about was my whole lifestyle the, the what I ate what I drank how I exercised how I dealt with mental stress how I dealt with repressed emotions and trauma and I literally spent I would say maybe a year working on all those things and that was just my own entryway into this whole paradigm there are people who are much more skilled and experienced and experts in this field but what it taught me which is what they teach and many traditional medicines in this area like ancient um, traditional Chinese medicine is that the body has a natural state and what we're doing through our ignorance is taking it out of that natural state. So healing is just about getting back to the natural state and removing the things that are damaging us. The, the, the current world of medicine or the dominant Western model of medicine doesn't look at things like that. It, it really looks at things of merely the symptom point of view. You have a symptom, let's just tidy up the symptom. Let's not look at what you did to cause that symptom and what you're doing to yourself. And it's also an industry and therefore 
doesn't always look to serve your best interests. And that's my personal experience. It's a very controversial area, but it's definitely been my personal experience. And, and I did heal the bleeding. <laughs> I did heal it. I went back to the hospital. They said, in, they were confident that everything I'd done was clearly healing whatever I did, although they, they didn't have much time from my points of view, but they said that that was good whatever I might have had is gone or not an issue anymore. And since then I've been in this space now healing many other things. It's not just that and it's certainly coming alive to the consciousness that that's possible, that makes it possible, but it is. Yeah, just as you were saying that, I could hear the sheep bleating and sheep are my lambs are one of my favourite animals and I was actually at a, a farm last year and I was watching the baby, the baby lambs and then I noticed they'd been separated from their mother for the slaughter and in one aspect it's, it's just logical you're on a farm. People farm animals. The other part of me was how have we got made it okay to separate a mother from her newborn children? How has that been made okay? Like where is that, where is our human the human part of us and why is it not saying that's not okay when we understand how we might feel as mothers of children? And that's when I'm talking about the shutdown of the feminine because we've just shut it off. It's there. And I think that that's symbolic in all of a lot of the way that we handle animals in industry, whether we're farming them from our food, and we're doing that in abusive ways often, or we're testing on them. And I, Chris often says that 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 is a mirror to how we treat ourselves. So, for example, the fact that we farm animals is quite similar to the fact we allow ourselves our, to, ourselves to be farmed to be part of a industrial machine we're only here to serve the machine and we're being farmed in a similar way and our treatment of the animals is a mirror to that and I, I resonate with that. You have to see this on that note, you just <laughs> described Oxyon. Ah, oh, really? You have to see it, it's absolutely oh. that. It shows you know, how the humans are literally farming themselves. <laughs> yeah. Amazing synchronicity. And I, I think that we've, we've often found ways to justify our treatment of animals through being in the head. Of course we can find a way to, we need to eat meat. And I think that there are people that do need to eat meat actually, but I think that we could farm in much more ways that are compassionate and humane. But ultimately, like a lot of the way we treat animals, you know, we, we need to test on them and then our abuse of them is when the head is only in operation. And I think when our heart comes on, we have to find another solution. It's not that, that we, we still don't need to do these things, but we, we're creative. We're creative. We can come up with other ways of doing it, and we don't have to keep making excuses for treating animals this way. Same with kind of anything else, right? We're creative. We exactly. We change the game. Aww. It doesn't have to stay, because it is a game right now, the system. It's just a shit game, as Mo put it. It's just a really shit game. Shit. <laughs> well, that's the whole, actually, at the heart of the Infinite World game is that idea that you are, we have this concept of creatorhood and creatorhood is about the fact that we are cre a creative species and you, we all are born creative, we have the capacity to create and the creative impulse itself comes from seeing something we don't like otherwise we don't create something and we're happy but if there's something we don't like it's like we go ah we don't like that we can create something and instead of putting up with things that we don't like assuming that we have to put up with them we can look to our creative capacity and say let's create something else and the infinite world game is about that entirely use your creativity and do what makes you come alive in that creativity because we all have different types of creativity but ultimately that creativity can allow us to create whatever we want the only limitation is the mind and at times the heart
what is love is a uh, can be answered in so many ways and is almost typically the unnameable thing I think I think I I resonate with the that with many philosophers that there are types of love so one might be the the personal romantic love you might experience with another person another type of love is that maternal love you might feel for your family or the human family or the you know that big big love in your heart that is unstoppable or in, feels infinite and then I think that there's the view that I think a lot of spiritual writers or thinkers have talked about which is that love is the whole fabric of the universe and a type it's it's consciousness itself it's the ability to be witness and be neutral and be non-attached and that force of beingness is capable of creating anything any universe and is 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 capable of I guess a uh, what we would we would experience as human beings as a a universal kind of I don't even know how to explain this a universal presence of beingness. I don't even think the sentence I just said made entire sense, but it's my own inability to describe what I think that that is. So. I, th I think I've given various definitions and I resonate with all of them. I think the, that ultimate love I talked about is is the love that connects and bonds everything because it is the witness and it's what we are outside of all the different manifestations of what we appear to be. It's, it's a bond that bonds every single thing in the universe. Mm. Like a glue. <laughs> a glue, yeah. Yeah, and it is almost like a one, a one being that we cannot perceive because of the human way of experiencing reality. Yeah. <laughs> okay, and then music is the other one. <laughs> That's a bit like what is love. <laughs> it's huge. <laughs> What, do, what, what the question is? What is what, what is, is music, music to, to me? You? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The role of music in, yeah, yeah. in the whole cosmic yeah, yeah. arena. Yeah. Well, when I was young, I, I just I don't think I'd be like sitting here without music because I suffered from extreme depression as a young person, and music was gave me an instant access to another. Now I'd call it energy. At the time, I'd be like another mood, and it was like it could instantly draw me out of what I was in into another mood. If I was feeling down and, you know, complete despair, if I put a certain tune on, I could suddenly be taken into joy and hope, and I'd be like, "That's amazing." And then as I got, you know, in my twenties, and I had this breakdown I talked about, I discovered then the healing power of music in a deeper way. It's the fact that. It's, it's different vibrationally and those vibrations can again have have even a healing at, on the physical in ways that I didn't understand so sound healing and things like that and tones of vibrations you know you feel them you feel them in your body but I was unconscious of that until until I had this breakdown in my late 20s so you know this has been this my unfolding journey with music and I, I'm a humongous music fan I think most people are in this space I just I eat music I just I still think that no matter what's happening I keep joking that on my social media that you know there might be cryptocurrencies and hollow chains and all that technology but Spotify is definitely the best invention of the last decade like but I more deeply and I've had messages through about this and visions that again we've been as a humanity and this reductionist material way of looking at life we we've tended to value things that are solid 
and not understand the the vibrational nature of reality and, and that subjective experience we get from different vibrations and music is a direct experience of that. So what I get is our, is our two hemispheres in our brain come together. Life itself can be seen as kind of musical and a vibrational experience, you know, like we dance. Life itself, we go through different vibrations and it's like a dance and it can be experienced almost in a musical way. And there are writers that have spoken about this and how higher reality might be ordered vibrationally and we might look at it through octaves and frequencies and sounds. And I, again, I think that's something that's totally developing right now. But I really resonate with that. I think that the new economy... I put this in my first strategic blueprint when I was running the network that the, the newer reality, the vibrational reality, will be musical. Um, like Alan Watts said, right? Did he say that? I love Alan Watts, but I didn't yeah. know he said that. Yeah, he, he did a little video um, where he was talking about the schooling system and then the, the work system and going through all of these these corridors into another into a bigger corridor, like and, and all of the time the carrot on the stick is at the end and yeah, kitty, 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 but you never quite make it. And when you do make it in the kind of reductionist, materialist sense, mm. then you still wake up and feel much like you always did. And, and like there's some kind of a hoax and there was a hoax it was a dreadful hoax because you were supposed to sing and dance while the music was being played mm. instead of like looking to the end because the music doesn't you know if the point of music was the end then you'd, you'd go to a concert just to see one clash yeah, <laughs> totally <laughs> that's totally i mean i'm i'm trying to, to tune in using a musical metaphor to to what i was seeing in in 2012 when I was getting a lot of these visions, the, I'm, I'm working from memory here, it's the concept that life, life is this dance you're talking about, so it's not about, like you say, this big movie arc with a big thing at the end where we go, yeah, and that was awesome, and the, only year, the year part was the only good thing about the journey. It was just the year part, and the rest was flat and dull. So it's more that every day, every moment, has a vibration and an experience and we dance with those moods and they go up and down and sometimes there are highs like I might have a high right now the fact that I'm sat in this beautiful space that's a high and then I might have a little mini low tonight and there's this musicality to the journey and it's a constant dance and song and then you know maybe maybe as I I go back to England in the summer like I'll move out of tropical dance into like a different type of dance a more serious energy and life is this constant dance and music with joy in it at every every verse and every chorus it's like you're the composer <laughs> you can choose yeah. the, the, the energy of the music exactly know? exactly and that's i was getting through what my guys refer to as a more spiral reality like experiencing life in these spirals and these dances and less getting out of the the more binary way of looking at a life experience. Mm -hmm. It's important. I think the question of around if someone's just waking up to this is keep following the the excitement because often when people wake up to this this kind of space they've done it because they've suddenly become curious about maybe they've had a depression maybe they got ill maybe they just felt unfulfilled and they suddenly want to take a look at this new age thing and that that kind of draw to what's happening is the energetic inside of you that's wanting to experience something else so keep trusting the feeling as well as listening to your head because the head is what's going to get in the way the head's going to go oh this is like they're all just a bunch of hippies they're not really doing anything and they can't really earn a living like that and how am i going to survive if you let the head take control its patterns are from the old paradigm so you have to learn to trust the feelings as well as as well as what your mind is telling you that's the first thing is to keep listening to your own self and the feelings and then the second thing is is just reach out to networks and start connecting with people and you'll find your way through the magic of the universe to where you're meant to be. So there are a couple of networks we're familiar with like United Earth and there's the Thrift Movement.
And there are many big groups on Facebook. Just find a network and start meeting people. Go to go down the road if there's like uh, some kind of event that's related to this. Go to a festival, meet people, and you'll find it will unfold naturally. And in time, we'll there'll be more tools to support people. But right now, it's very much about trusting you. You've got in your intuition and. As, as some of our friends used to say in Synergy Hub, allowing yourself to find the others. <laughs> you will find the others. Okay, thank you so much, Andrea. Thank you. <laughs> Can I have a hug? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I keep feeling like I'm just doing 500 flies. <laughs> you did amazing.